we're just about to start the proof of Stokes' theorem for real, but um, I want to pull out a really nice, easy consequence of Stokes' theorem first. So here's the, the situation. We've got a k-dimensional object. We could sort of think of it as a generalized surface. Um, there's various technical terms. A fairly accurate one for what we're dealing with is called a submanifold in Rn. Um, and alpha is going to be a k minus 1 form in Rn. And that doesn't quite match the dimension of the surface. The reason for that is that we're going to take d alpha, which is a k form, and we're going to integrate it on m. And our conjecture is that that's the same thing as if we took the original form and integrated it over the boundary of m. And this is incredibly general. How, how, um, this is true in incredible generality, uh, well beyond what we can actually prove um, or even talk about. But let's assume that for a second. And I want to show that that gives you an alternate explanation for y d squared is 0. Okay. So read, read number 1 real quick. And I want to explain something. This, this is something I, haven't, I don't think I've really made a video of. And that's this wonderful fact that the boundary of a boundary of anything is equal to 0. And why is that true? Well, let's just look at an example. And the cube is going to be very relevant to us in a minute. Well, we have to be re keep real careful track of orientations. Well, let's orient the cube in such a way that when we look at its boundary, uh, we get a consistent orientation all over its boundary. So we want a, a good way to think about boundaries, or, sorry, about orientations is like a swirl. I've talked about this before. Instead of using a normal vector, which would be very special to R3 in this case, we can just look at a little swirl. But notice this swirl is going counterclockwise as I look up. Imagine rounding off this edge. Suppose it weren't actually a sharp edge. Then that swirl, I should be able to deform that swirl continuously over to this face without drastically changing it. The only way to do that is if the swirl on this guy is going this way. That's the really the consistent orientation. And then if I drag the swirl down onto the bottom face, then it's got to be going this way. So you want to you want to make sure you can picture that that this swirl going counterclockwise here, if you sort of rotate the cube or or equivalently sort of drag that swirl across, that it's going to be going clockwise on the bottom face if you look at it from the top. Okay, it's very relevant that that's opposite to how this looks if you look at it from the top. This looks um, counterclockwise from the top. You might think, how is that consistent? Well, remember, th let's think about the normal vector picture for just a minute. If you're inside the cube and you're looking out, this guy's going to look like it's rotating the same way as this guy's rotating. Similarly, the only way to drag this over and get the right kind of consistent orientation is like this. And let's see what happens when I look at the boundary of the boundary. OK, so the boundary of this face is these are these edges. And that swirl is supposed to indicate that its boundary orientation looks like that. Whereas this front face, I'll put that in red, it has a boundary orientation like this. Notice these guys cancel in pairs. This one, put that in green. That green swirl goes like this, 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 this. And these guys cancel in pairs as well. And if you analyze it all across the whole thing, they all cancel in pairs. So I'm not going to come up with like a, a fancy algebraic proof of this because um, we haven't. I, I'm kind of avoiding giving you the all the nitty gritty details of how to define boundaries and doing it mostly pictorially. But um, you might want to convince yourself: just take any kind of object, consistently orient or any surface, consistently orient the surface of that, and with a swirl that if you deform it and sort of drag it across the surface, it's the same swirl, and then look at the boundary of the boundary of that object, and that's going to be zero. So another way to say it is that if some surface like N is a boundary, if it is the boundary of something, it is itself boundaryless. Uh, this is an incredibly general concept of the boundary of the boundary is zero. It shows up in, in topology, algebra, all over the place. But the, so what I want to do is assume that this is known that the boundary of a boundary is 0. And then we can use it to get a different under, a new understanding of why it is that d squared of a form is 0. 
we've seen an explicit calculation involving Clairaut's theorem and plus or minus signs, but I find that somewhat unsatisfying. I, I really like geometric pictorial explanations better. Maybe it's just me. And there's a very easy way to do this. What we're going to do is we're going to take d squared alpha, and we're going to take any old object that we could in integrate that over. So if alpha is a k form, this is going to have to be a k plus 2 surface, a manifold, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then I'm just going to use Stokes' theorem twice. That's the, over the integral over the boundary of d alpha. But that's the integral over the boundary of the boundary of alpha. No matter what alpha was to start with, no matter what m was to start with, that's the integral over nothing, and that's 0. So you might think, oh, that shows that this particular integral of this guy is 0. But this is true for every m. So let's think about that. For example, uh, just in, I don't know, in R3 with a 1 form, the integral over every possible curve you can imagine, short, big, whatever direction, is always 0. It's not too hard to convince yourself that the only possible way that could be true is if this form, d squared alpha, is identically the 0 form. There's no place where it's non-zero. Because the job of this guy is to be integrated over things, and it's always giving 0. The only thing that's going to do that is 0. Again, you can make that into a more detailed argument, but that's really the idea. So that's probably the last proof I'm going to give you of d squared equals 0, but it's, it's one of the best. All right, so now number 2, the proof of Stokes. The idea is a very popular one in mathematics. Prove something in a model case, and then show you can reduce the general case to a model. And it's amazing. In the next video, I'll show you how amazingly it is easy it is to reduce the model. Okay. So what we're going to do is the unit cube, ik is just all where all the coordinates is just the set of x such that all the coordinates are between 0 and 1. I'm going to draw it as the 3 cube. Here's x going out. And we're going to have to be a little careful about orientations here to get the signs right. OK. And um, I want to, yeah, speaking of orientations, let's be real careful. Let's actually go, let's actually just warm up with, we're going to have to be real careful at orienting the cube. If it's the 1 cube, that's the interval, then it's plus and minus here at 1 and 0. So it's sort of the ordinary orientation at the far end and the opposite orientation, a minus sign, at the, at the 0 end. We're pretty familiar with what the correct orientation of the unit, uh, the unit square is. It's counterclockwise. And what I want to focus on, it's going to turn out to be that I'm going to be really focusing on just the two parts of the boundary where x1, oh yeah, yeah let's try these, say these x1, x2, x3 actually, not x, x, y, and z, because that'll generalize this better. I'm just going to, it turns out I'm going to just need to know about the, the parts of the boundary where x1 equals 1 and everything else is between 0 and 1 and x1 equals 0. Notice that we get the ordinary orientation going from x2 is 0 to x2 is 1 on the far end. So that's kind of the plus orientation, and here I get the minus orientation. Now I've shown you the picture already for the orientation of the cube that's the standard one. That is going to be counterclockwise up here at x, ooh, sorry, let's, uh, let's do it, x1 equals 1. That's going to be going uh, counterclockwise in the front face and clockwise in the back face. Now, it's not really completely clear, but that's on the back. So again, it's the, the normal orientation you'd expect for a unit square when x1 equals 1, the opposite when x1 equals 0. Doesn't really look very good. OK. So that's a really important thing about orientations that we're going to have to be careful about. So here's what we want to show. We want to show, of course, that integral of d alpha over the whole unit cube is the integral over the boundary of the unit cube of alpha itself. Now in general, alpha is going to be, um, take, take a look and take a look at part a here. I claim we can assume something special about alpha. In general, alpha is going to be like p dx2 wedge dx3 wedge dxn plus q dx1 wedge dx2 wedge if it's an n minus, ooh, it's, it's going to be a k, sorry. I probably forgot to, yeah, no, I didn't show it. It's going to be, um, 
Oh, dx1, dx3. There we go. Let's say it's something where the 1 is missing or something where the 2 is missing, plus dot, dot, dot. It's a linear combination of various things. Each one is going to be missing exactly one of the dx's so that it has, it's a k minus 1 form, so that you integrate d alpha over all of ik. But both these sides are linear. d is linear. The integration process is linear. So if it works for one of these pieces, certainly there's a coordinate symmetry here that it should, if it works for one, it should work for everything. And uh, if it works for each individual piece separately, it's going to work for the sum. So we're just going to assume that it's of this form. And that's going to simplify our argument a bit. Okay. So that was getting a little messy. Let me put it up here. Okay. So alpha is just p, and we're going to leave out the dx, the dx1, um, and it's just going to be all the other dx's wedged together in that order. Okay. And this is what I want to show. So the next step, part b, you might want to calculate that d alpha explicitly. It's not hard. d alpha. You're going to take all the different derivatives of p and match them up, but they're all mostly going to die. Because if I took derivative with respect to x2, I'd put in an extra dx2, etc. So it's just going to be dp dx1 dx1 through dxk. OK, so let's integrate that. The integral of that over ik, OK, well, Let's expand that out very explicitly. A lot of this is just sort of follow your nose, make things more explicit. That's going to be integral 0 to 1, 0 to 1, dot, 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 integral 0 to 1, dp dx1, dx1, dx2. And I'm just going to drop the wedges, because they're all in the right order. Don't need a minus sign, and that's how we integrate k forms in rk. We just drop the wedges. Now look at this. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus, the integral of a derivative. So that's going to be very interesting. Okay, I'm going to erase all this stuff. My little board. Okay. That's going to go back up to be the integral. Still k minus 1 integrals. And they are going to do absolutely nothing interesting. That's part of the beauty of this. And then this is just going to be p of 1 comma x2 through xk. I don't need that arrow there. There we go minus p of 0 x2 through xk. That's what the fundamental theorem says. And then the other integrals are still operative, but I'm really not going to have to worry about them. OK. So let me just separate that into two pieces. That's the integral over the x2 through xk of p of 1, etc., dx2 dxk, minus the integral over all these other variables, p of 0, et cetera, dx2, dot, 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 dxk. OK. Um, well, if you're looking at this, this cube, for example, that's where there'd be two integrals here. No dot dots in here, no, no, no real dot dot dots here. But so let, look at that picture if you're getting it all uh, confused by the, the dot dot dots. This is exactly what happens if you take p, uh, take alpha, and you just restrict it to the front face here and integrate it over the front face. That's part of the integral over the whole boundary of the cube. What about if you take p and you restrict it to the back face? That's exactly this guy with an opposite sign. So here you're using the correct orientation. Here you're using the opposite orientation. That's exactly what you're supposed to do to consider these two faces as opposite faces of the cube. Now there's something maybe a little bit weird. What about the other? There's many, many other faces to the boundary of this unit cube in general. There's four other faces in, in three dimensions. There's going to be many, many other faces in other dimensions. But let's think about what, for example, the integral of like p dx2 dxk over like the face where, say, x2 is 0. Remember, this, these guys are faces where x1 is set to be 1 or 0. But what if the thing that's set to be a constant is one of the variables in the dx's? Remember, one way to think about the, this form, integrating a form dx2 through dxk, is I project to the x2 through xk plane, or subspace to be more precise in, in, in k dimensions. But if I'm doing that, if x2 is equal to 0 and I project to that plane, it's going to be, it's going to collapse. So for example, here, this face 
is where x2 is equal to 1, if I'm going to do an operation like integrate dx2 through d dx2 dx3, for example, I'm going to be projecting that onto a subset that has zero area. And so all those are going to die. So the other faces die. Okay. And so in fact, uh, let's see. I kind of hate to erase that right after I write it, but it's the right place to put it. So this, in fact, is the integral over the entire boundary of alpha. Now, you might think, again, wait, how can those other phases not contribute? Remember, I picked alpha to be a very special type. If I had picked it to be something where the dx9 was missing, for example, it would be the faces where x9 was 1 or 0 that would contribute. But remember, once I prove it for this form, symmetrically it's going to work for all the other variables. And then um, it's going to work for combinations, and it's going to work in general. Okay, so um, I can't, probably should have scrolled down here because I kind of got ahead of myself. So we've done all these steps here. We've expressed the result as a difference of integrals over two faces. Um, we this one we did before, in fact. I kind of jumped the gun on that, and we just talked about how it, the integral of alpha of this type vanishes over exa everything but the, the faces that were identified here. And then that's it. We've got it. There's no other contribution, and we've got Stokes' theorem for the unit cube. Now, in the next video, we'll talk about how that's anything but a trivial special case or a warm-up. That's the heart of the proof because of all the other machinery we've already got going.